Welcome back to our series of videos, a sequence of four dealing with the sizing of simple span wide flange steel beams using multi-frame. In video one or session one, we used Excel as a preprocessor to calculate loads and we created a table that would allow us to tabulate and record uh, the results of our sizing procedure. In session two, we set up the structural steel frame for a two-story tall uh, steel frame system with um, two bays. <clears throat> and now we're getting ready to load the structure in multi-frame. This is session three. And we're going to use the information that we generated in Excel previously. So if we go look at that, um, we have a table like this which contains load information and then over here we have um, the columns in which we're going to keep the record of the sizing procedures where we're sizing for stiffness and strength in these beams. <clears throat> You'll recall that previously when we were working out of tables we had to calculate loads like this which are the loads on um, girders uh, we don't have to do that in multi-frame. All we have to do is load the joist or the secondary beams and those loads will automatically get transferred to uh, the girders. So you'll recall we had 20 pounds per square foot for the dead load on the roof, 20 pounds per square foot for the live load. Because we had a 5 foot spacing, 5 times 20 gives us 100 pounds per linear foot along the joist which converts to 0.1 kips per foot. So in this uh, spreadsheet, we had the formulas, which we used to um, calculate. So whatever formula was put into this formula bar above represents whatever that formula is there. And it got presented here in this form because it's visually more comprehensible. Mathematics is a language which we have learned as part of our cultural process to read, whereas this bar up here um, is a little less clear. All right, so we have this 0.1 kips per foot um, along uh, the length of the joist due to the dead load. We have the same alive load on the roof joist. And then down below for the uh, floor joist, because we had 53 pounds per square foot of decking load, when we multiply that times 5, we get 265 pounds per foot of dead load along the floor joist or the secondary beams in the floor. And that becomes 0.265 kips per foot. And then we were assuming 100 pounds per square foot of live load. So 100 times 5 is 500 pounds per foot along the floor joist, which converts to 0.5 kips per foot. <clears throat> Now, right now, all we need to get out of this Excel spreadsheet are these four numbers, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.265, and 0.5. Eventually, we're going to use the rest of the spreadsheet, and we're going to fill it in. But for right now, we're going to go back to our multi-frame file, which we generated in our last session. So you can, uh, if you if you want to avoid contaminating your files or to have a sort of breadcrumb sequence, you can save off that file as your uh, structural frame input file and start another one where we're talking about um, inputting the loads. Um, if you don't want that breadcrumb uh, history of what you've done, you just keep working with exactly the same file. Okay, so just to re refresh your memory, uh, we're in the frame window and we can render this to see what it looks like. And you'll recall that all the uh, beams were W18 by 35 and all the columns were W14 by 808. That means nominal 14 inches by 808 pounds per foot. And you'll recall we just picked that monster big section just to ease our job in sizing the beams so that we know that any movement that takes place 
is essentially all within the beam. So I'm going to turn off that render and now we have to go insert some loads and the way we do that is we want to switch from the frame window to the load window. So we're going to click on load and now we're going to go to a 3D view and we're going to kind of orient this a little bit like so and then I'm going to hit control T which means control total or uh, fill the frame just to make the image a little bit bigger <clears throat> And now we need to figure out how to insert some loads. And you'll notice, by the way, that the icons that are up here have changed when we went from the frame window to the load window. In the frame window, we had ways of generating members uh, and arrays of members. And now when we go to the load window, we have a different set of things. And we have, for example, uh, up here a... Um, a menu called load but we also have other ways of loading things <clears throat> now we're going to go here to so-called cases and when you click on that you're going to see there is only one case that's in here so far uh, multi-frame put it in arbitrarily and called it load case one um, it would be very rare that we would ever call anything load case one. So we can put some loads in there and then we can rename that if we want to. Um, but what we're probably going to do is just get rid of that load case because we're going to go in and add a bunch of our own load cases. And then uh, we can just delete the one that doesn't have the right name that we would like. So we can go up here and we can say add case. And you'll notice it gives us a whole bunch of options, one of which is self-weight, another is static, another is static combined. Um, there's a time history, which has to do with loads that vary over time, which, by the way, uh, seismic is an example of that. And then there's another one below that that says specifically seismic. These are two different versions of seismic loading. And they even have things like C motion, which uh, we w wouldn't be using that, but this tool is widely used for ship design. And so uh, that becomes a, a really interesting tool. And of course, it might also be interesting if you're designing for a hurricane environment where you have storm surges that have to be addressed. So you may have water current or C motion or various things, buoyancy effects. Um, that could be accounted for. In our case, uh, we're going to just look at initially static effects of gravity, uh, which means we're going to look at self-weight and some static loads like the dead load of decking and the live load of uh, people in the building. The first case we're almost always going to want is the self-weight, and there will be exceptions to this. We might do some analysis in some very pure load cases when we're talking about idealized shapes of parabolic arches and things of that sort we might omit the self-weight but for right now we're definitely interested in it because it's a crucial part of the sizing of these beams so we're going to click on self-weight and some things come up here you'll notice this minus 32.174 that's the acceleration of gravity if you were 200 miles or 400 miles up in, in space, that number might vary appreciably. And if you really wanted to distinguish between building in Death Valley and building on the top of Mount Everest, this number would change a little bit. But for us, we're just going to accept that that's the gravitational constant. And to be honest, it varies only minutely over the range of altitudes that human beings are able to occupy. So we're going to click OK. And now when we go to cases, we see we've got self-weight and that original load case one. And now we're going to add another case and we're going to add static. And we're going to call this dead. And sometimes I call this dead imposed because self-weight is a kind of dead weight. 
or, or dead load. Um, and so for, if we're being very clear, we want to talk about, distinguish that from dead imposed, which would be the dead weight of the decking and HVAC equipment and stuff like that. But for our purposes, uh, we, we sort of understand that, that dead is being handled within multi-frame as an imposed load, and we're adding that on top of the self-weight, which multi-frame calculates for us already. And by the way, it's extremely helpful that multi-frame does that because uh, sometimes the computation of the self-weight of the beam, as we're constantly sizing and resizing, is very annoying. But also, one of the beautiful things about a program like this is once you've done the final sizing, you can actually push a button in this program and it will tell you what the entire self-weight of the structure is, which allows you to pretty accurately estimate the cost for the construction of the building. And uh, in fact, I have worked on fairly major projects where the, the cost estimate of the builder was actually based on the total pounds of steel as calculated out of multi-frame from my analysis. Uh, for that builder, it was an enormous savings in time to be able to work off of my number as opposed to recalculating it all from scratch. All right, so we're going to say OK. And now when we check case, we see we have dead self in that load case one. And now we're going to add one more static case, which we're going to call live. And now we're going to add one more, which is a static combined. And the reason we need a static combined is we need a factored load case because that's going to determine the strength design for the structure. So I'm going to say static combined. And then I've got to come up with a name for it. And I'm going to call it 1.2 self plus... 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. Uh, these are our load factors that we've talked about before. Any kind of dead load has a self has a load factor of 1.2, which gives us this 20% safety factor that we've talked about. Live loads are less accurately understood, so we put an even higher live load a higher load factor on the live of 1.6. Now, this is my name to communicate with me so that when I look at it, I know what I'm looking at. The computer doesn't understand this name at all, though. So in order to communicate with the computer, I have to come down and put these load factors in. So I'm putting in a load factor of 1.2 for the self-weight, 1.2 for the dead imposed, and 1.6 for the live. And now what the computer understands is the same as what I understand because my name up here has reflected the load factors that I've communicated to the computer. So now I'm going to say OK. And I have the four load cases that I need uh, in order to um, perform the sizing procedures that I want to perform. And by the way, the crucial load cases are live, which we're going to use for deflection calculations, and full factored load, which we're going to, to use for strength analysis. And by the way, we have a case here we don't want, which is cluttering up our menu, which is this load case one. So I'll go to delete case and I'll pick that and I'll say delete it. And now when I look at my loads, I've got this nice clean collection of gravity loads, which are the self-weight of the structure itself, the dead load that's impo imposed on the structure, the live load that's imposed on the structure, and then the total factored gravity load. So I have all the load cases I need. And by the way, it's, it's really good. You could, if you wanted to, combine um, things, but... For example, you can put in live load plus dead load all in one window. It just creates a tremendous confusion. And because 
this program has this beautifully simple way of using various load combinations, you really want to keep all these load cases separate so that you can do all kinds of combinations. And in fact, if you look at the code, there are about 15 different load combinations which may have to be accounted for in your structure. And it would be crazy to try to construct each one of those separately when in fact all you have to do is put in these separate load cases and then use combinations with appropriate load factors. Okay, so <clears throat> Okay, so <clears throat> we would like to start inputting some loads. Now, you'll notice if I select some of these uh, beams and I go up here and I say load, you'll notice everything is grayed out. And there's a reason for that. Um, I happen to be, if I go look at cases, you'll notice I'm in load case, the factored load case. Multiframe will not allow you to put loads into the factored load case. If you did that, you're going to get really confused because the whole point of doing the combined factored loads is that they are a combination of these pure load cases like dead or live. If you start taking part of your live loads and sticking them into this combined factored load case, you're going to get horribly confused. So basically, it's saying you can't input anything here, and that's fine. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to one of our other load cases. We're not going to self because self is automatically calculated by the program. So we'll start with dead. And now when we go up here and we say we want to load it, we are given choices. We can do a global joint load, um, a global joint moment. There's a bunch of different things we can do here. And by the way, you'll notice it says unload joint. And that's really crucial. If you put in a load that you don't like, you can't just go add another load to it and hope it's going to replace that. The computer program doesn't know that you want to replace some load that's there. And so if, if you intend to do that, the first thing you have to do is unload the joint with the previous load and then add your new load. So this unload joint function or own unload member function is crucial. Now down under member loads, we can do a global distributed load, a global point load or whatever. Global means that it's in the sort of the coordinate system that we normally think of in space, such as gravity loads or, or uh, vertical loads, and then we have wind loads that are horizontal forces. Um, on this particular structure, everything we're going to deal with is a global load. Uh, we can put local loads for, say, sloped members that have wind suction on a roof or whatever, and those uh, the f directions of those forces are relative to the member orientation. But our, for our purposes, we're going to be dealing just with global distributed load. So I'm going to click here, and you'll notice it comes up with this image that shows the beam. It shows the, the load starting some distance in, going over a certain distance, and varying over that distance, and then stopping before it gets to the end. Now. This is actually the load case we're most interested in. So you wonder why multi-frame opens in this particular load case, but it turns out to be okay. They're basically reminding you that you have the power to do this. You can vary this load in terms of where it starts, where it stops, and what its value is over that uh, period or that portion of the beam where it exists. All that is there. And your life is not terribly complicated because you'll notice it starts off with the less di left, left distance equal to zero and the right distance equal to zero. So in other words, because this is zero and that's zero, this load case is assumed to go all the way across. The second thing is you'll, you'll discover when you put in a left magnitude, the right magnitude is already always set equal to that. So to actually get this kind of variable load, you then have to go set a second value for the right magnitude. So the truth is, all we need to do is set in the left magnitude for this load case 
and it will end up looking exactly like that. So there's not uh, additional work required of us in order to get this as our default load case. So the dead load that we calculated from our Excel spreadsheet was 0.1 kips per foot for the roof joist. So I'm going to put 0.1 here and you'll notice that the right end goes to 0.1 which is what I want so I'm not going to change that. So I'll click on that and you'll notice it's now showing uh, the vertical downward forces. And now you'll notice it says dead load here and also when we go to case dead load is clicked so now I'm going to go to live load I'm on, I have the same beam selected it's just I've changed my load case to live and now I'm going to go um, load that by saying global distributed load and by the way you'll notice the default case is vertical downward in other words the default case is gravity uh, we could do wind suction by picking this one we could put some kind of lateral wind force using one of these but we're in the gravity load case so we're going to stick with this default vertical downward case uh, the live load was the same as the dead load it's 0.1 kips per foot so we're going to click OK and we now have now in that instant fully loaded the roof girders with both dead plus live and I'll step through that again just to emphasize that the dead looks like that the live looks like this and while we're here we might as well look at uh, the self weight and you'll notice there's nothing there um, and that's because the program has come up uh, set in that mode but if we want to see the loads we can go to um, display and some of this may have been changed So we're going to go to display symbols. Now when we look here we say loads. So it's showing us loads, load values, load shading. And what it's not showing us right now is self weight. So we're going to put self weight and click OK. And now you'll notice that the self weight is 0.035 for all these beams kips per foot and that makes sense because we made all those beams W18 by 35s which means they're 18 inches deep 35 pounds per linear foot 35 pounds per foot is 0 0.035 kips per foot and here they show arrows in the vertical direction now here's one of the sort of graphic problems we have with expressing loads um, the columns have a certain self weight which in this case was 808 pounds per foot because we picked a W14 by 808. Um, those would be a series of arrows that are all lying on top of each other on top of the column. So in an attempt to uh, express the magnitude of those we can't just have a bunch of arrows lying on top of each other. So we've created this thing we call a flag and the width of this flag is proportional to what that load is. So you'll notice by the way these arrows here are not very high because this is only 0 0.035 kips per foot whereas this is 0 0.808 kips per foot so this flag is relatively wide relative to the height. So everything here is still scaled it's just this is hatched rather than having arrows because in fact it represents a vertical load that is the self weight of the column. Some people prefer to leave the self weight off uh, because they feel like it sometimes clutters the diagram but for the moment we're going to leave it on and we're going to go to this case which is now the combination uh, with all the factored loads of uh, the self weight of the roof joists 
the dead load on the roof joist, the live load on the roof joist. And what we see here is we have the self weight. And by the way, this now says 0 0.042, which is 1.2 times 0 0.035. In other words, this is the factored self weight for that W18 by 35. Um, and by the way, 808 times 1.2 is this new number that represents the factored self weight of the column. Now, we're not quite through loading this because we have to go back and load the floor joist. So I'm going to select all those. I'm in dead load. The dead load um, for um, the uh, floor was 0.265. That was this number right here, which came from our 53 pounds per square foot times five feet. And while we're here, we'll remember that the live load is 0.5 kips per foot. So we have 0.265 kips per foot for the dead, 0.5 kips per foot for the, for the live. And now we're going to go back to our multi-frame. We're in dead, so we're going to say load, global distributed load, and we're going to put 0.265. And the other end comes out to be the same. So I'm going to click OK. And now I'm going to uh, shift to the live load. And then I'm going to say load, global distributed load, and I'm going to put 0.5. So now I have a fully loaded structure, and I can uh, analyze it either under live load, which is what I'm showing right now, to look at deflection, or I can analyze it under full factored load. So. Um, in, the, in the next section, we're going to do that extensively, but just for the moment, to let you know where we're going, this is our plot window, and I'm going to the plot window, and there's nothing there, by the way, and the reason is we haven't analyzed. So we're going to go to Analyze, and we have a choice, by the way, between linear and nonlinear, and for the moment, I'm going to tell you that 99% of what you will build in life can be analyzed in linear mode. Nonlinear tends to apply to structures that only become active after they've changed shape substantially. So we do nonlinear analysis in some fairly esoteric places. We're going to mainly focus on linear. So we do a linear analysis, and now we have um, an image which shows something or other, and that something or other, by the way, is defined right here. It says MZ prime. Uh, I'm not sure why uh, a program like this comes up in MZ prime. Um, I tend to be more interested in it in terms of stress and keeping stress down below some reasonable level so the structure won't fail. So I almost am never interested in moment. I want to know about moment stresses. But there are a bunch of different things we can show here, like deflection. And, and by the way, while we're about this, moment is typically displayed above. And here we see it displayed below. So we're going to go here and look at preferences. And it says draw moments. And right now, the default setting was on the tension face. I'm going to pick on the compression face. And by the way, it's perfectly legitimate to do it either way. Um, some structural groups prefer it one way, some the other way. For example, at the University of Illinois, where they have a truly outstanding engineering college, they always pick on the tension face. But most places have settled on the convention of on the compression face. And so when I click OK, you'll notice that those uh, moment curves are presented on the other side, on the top. Now, I also have the potential for 3D views, which I had before. Um, 
We've mentioned, and I'm going to hit control total to blow this up, that for live loads, we're mainly going to be looking at deflection. And uh, we talked about the fact that in this case, we're doing a 30 foot beam. Um, that's 360 inches long. L over 360 is 360 inches over 360, or in other words, a deflection of one inch. If I look at this beam and I click on it, and I want to get out of that image, by the way, at some point, it says it's deflected 3.6 inches, um, which is way too much. So we know that beam is drastically undersized for stiffness. On the other hand, when we go click on this beam, it says that the vertical deflection is 0.125, so it's oversized for the roof joist. But we're in live load. I want to emphasize we're in live load and we're looking at deflection and we're, we're basically making the structure stiff enough in live load that it won't be disturbing and, and people won't feel a lot of movement. On the other hand, if we're going to go to the full factored load, then we want to look at um, some different quantity. And what we're going to look at is the um, member stresses. So we're going to go under display. We'll go down to member stresses and we're going to pick bending SBZ prime top. So S for stress, B for bending, Z prime, meaning it's about the Z axis for the member. And we're looking at it on the top of the member and it looks something like that. If we want to attach values to it, there's a toggle switch right here that says plot labels display. And now we can zoom in and we see that the stress here is uh, something quite large. I'll tilt this up a little bit. And that says 164 kips per square inch. We're targeting 50 kips per square inch under full factored load. And that's what we're under right now. So we know that this beam is drastically undersized. On the other hand, we expect that this one is drastically oversized, if I can get that to react, because its bending stress, SBZ prime top, is only 7.5 KSI, and we know the material is capable of handling 50. So we somehow expect that that beam is pretty drastically undersized. And by the way, every time I click on a member to go look at the details of it, the, this allows me to get out of that view. And by the way, I can hit escape or I can hit this little uh, symbol right here. So there I hit the symbol. Uh, here I'm going back to that member and I hit escape and it brings me back to the larger frame. So in the last session of this series of videos, you're going to be switching back and forth between live load where you're looking at deflection and full factored load where you're looking at bending stress uh, as indicators of how well the beams are performing. And you're going to be trying to keep the deflection under live load less than an inch. And you're going to be trying to keep the stress level less than 50 KSI under this full factored load. But your goal is to produce the lightest beams that will achieve those goals. That ends session three of our four session series of videos on sizing simple span wide flange steel beams using multi-frame. We've been talking about how to load the structure in multi-frame. In session four, we're going to go through and iteratively select beam sizes um, and test them uh, by trial and error where the analysis is actually performed internal to multi-frame. So we'll pick members for the roof joist, for example, and then for the floor joist, and then subsequently for the girders. Or in other words, we do the secondary beams first and then the primary beams. And the reason we have to do that is we have to size the secondary beams 
first because they represent one of the loads on the primary beam. So it makes no sense to size the primary beams and then go size the joist or the secondary beams because then you have to resize the primary beams. So that ends session three.